It's a great pleasure to be at a, at a sister institution, not that far from my own home university. Um, I was thinking on my way down, and then once I got here, um, what a shame it is that we really don't uh, visit each other's campuses as often as we should. This is my first visit to UC San Diego, and I hope it won't be my last. So um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, a topic. You know, lecture topics don't fall from the sky. They actually have histories. So I'm going to try and give you a little bit of the history that brought me to this topic. In 1990, in the early 1990s, before, um, I mean, feminist studies, gender studies had already taken hold within religious studies, but it's, it was mostly being done by um, scholars of Christianity, Judaism, and it really had not yet uh, filtered down into Buddhism. Very few scholars were working on topics of um, Buddhism and women, Buddhism and gender. But through a series of fortuitous events, I put together some panels at the, our annual, the annual meeting of the American Academy of Religion, and this evolved into this book called Buddhism, Sexuality, and Gender, which is one of the first collections of essays on this topic. A few years after that, um, th are there any Unitarians in the audience? The Unitarians owned this island off the coast of New Hampshire, which is called Star Island. And every summer they have courses for members and for, I think, even uh, pe people who aren't necessarily your Unitarians can also attend these conferences, and they always choose a theme. And then they invite speakers to come and speak on this theme. Well, th this portion, these conferences are, for many years, it was done in coordination with a, an academic institution called Institute for Religion in an Age of Science, ARAS which publishes a fairly well-known well journal called Zygon in Religion and Science. In any case, to make a long story short, in 1999, the theme was religion and sexuality. And maybe because I had published this book um, called Buddhism, Sexuality, and Gender, or edited it, that I was invited to be one of the speakers at the Star Island Conference. And as a result of you know, two or three days of intensive conversations with colleagues in a wide variety of different fields, including people who worked on uh, sexuality and neuroscience and developmental psychology, people who worked on, um, on, on the theology of sexuality, uh, on sexual ethics in different w religious traditions. Um, I decided that I really needed to pursue this topic uh, more, and simply because it's, sexuality is a very interesting topic. Now, a few years after that, actually, um, let's see when the last one, 1999, so 2007, eight years after, a group of gay and lesbian Buddhists in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, wrote an open letter to the Dalai Lama. They found out that the Dalai Lama was slated to give some lectures in, in San Francisco, and they, they wrote a letter to him asking to meet with him so that to ask him to address some issues that in, in statements that he had made that they felt um, were problematic insofar as they believed um, um, expressed homo homophobic feelings uh, and that they felt the Dalai Lama needed to clarify. So the Dalai Lama agreed, and I was at that meeting, and it was a very interesting meeting. It began, some members of the, of the group uh, told their personal stories about the way that uh, they had been treated by their religious communities or by their 
families when they came out. Um, and um, after this, it was the, when it was the Dalai Lama's, I mean, the Dalai Lama's clearly moved by these stories, many of which were very difficult. And um, that when the Dalai Lama spoke, he said that there was really no way to justify uh, the oppression of uh, GLBTQ people at all, and that he certainly supported um, the group in their efforts to, um, to deal with the issue of the oppression of sexual minorities. But then the Dalai Lama began to speak from the Buddhist point of view, and he made clear that the, the question of what is sexually appropriate and what is sexually inappropriate, what, what constitutes sexual misconduct according to Buddhism, um, according to the ancient sources, what the ancient texts say about these issues is, is quite complex. And it isn't necessarily what, what people want to hear, what modern people want to hear, in part because, and it really doesn't have to do so much with sexuality as with certain sexual acts that are considered inappropriate from a Buddhist point of view, meaning oral sex, anal sex, masturbation, sex during the day, all of these things are prohibited or proscribed in ancient Buddhist texts. And the Dalai Lama said um, that this is not something that he could himself adjudicate because it's, it's found in the text and therefore it requires some kind of consensus in the Buddhist community in order to be able to change these ancient norms. He, but he did kind of point to the ways in which this might occur. And one of the ways, one of the examples he gave was this. He said, look, the ancient texts also say that um, that prostitution is not prohibited, that it's allowed, um, that, but that only men may avail themselves of the services of sex workers and not women. And the Dalai Lama said, clearly from our modern perspective, this is highly problematic. So he said, that it is probably possible to make an argument that these other norms that are found in the ancient texts are also written from the point of view of specific cultures at a specific point in time. But he said these arguments would have to be made. And especially what he did at the end of this was to call for more research. So I took this as a cue that I really should finish the book that I was working on, which I'd, I'd been working on for a long time before the Star Island Conference, but now uh, with the Dalai Lama calling for more research, my goal was really to set forth in this book what the ancient text actually had to say and to kind of point the finger, as the Dalai Lama had done, in the direction of um, a more just contemporary um, sexual ethic in conversation with the ancient texts, but at the same time um, that was clearly more inclusive, that wasn't uh, um, oppressive of, of women uh, or of uh, GLBT people, and that um, um, was really what Buddhism intended ethics to be, which is a kind of liberating thing rather than being an oppressive thing. So this led to the publication of this book, which Dick was kind enough to mention. It, the book is called Sexuality in Classical South Asian Buddhism. And as the title implies, it's a, a kind of compendium that deals with ancient Buddhist ideas. If you, if you look at the, under the themes, it deals with themes like cosmology, the, the myths related to sexual embodiment, what desire is according to Buddhist psychology and its antidotes, um, what 
biological sex is, that is what biological embodiment is, which is kind of the subject of my lecture tonight, um, gender and sexual desire, uh, non-normative sexualities or deviant sexualities, what the Buddhist texts classify as sexual deviance and why, and then finally uh, sexual ethics. So all, these are the themes that structure the book, but the source material are really ancient texts from around the first century CE to around the eighth or ninth century CE, mostly written in the ancient languages of Buddhism, which are Pali, Sanskrit, and Tibetan. These texts were almost all written by monks, by Buddhist monks, which means that they were written by men. And this is something that we need to keep in the back of our minds as I'm about to tell you um, what the texts say about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. The genres of these texts are very diverse. They, some are medical texts, some uh, are legal works, some come from the erotic uh, tradition um, that's known as Kama Shastra in India. The most famous example of this is the Kama Sutra, the treatise on erotics. And of course, many, many of these works are religious works. Now, a few months ago in November, some colleagues um, honored me by focusing uh, a panel at the American Academy of Religion meetings in Denver on the book. And it was an interesting panel. It was very good and very constructive dialogue. Um, one of the things that I was challenged about was whether or not there was enough on women's sexuality in, in the book. And my initial take on this was that there really was an awful lot on women's sexuality, but then I really, I came to realize that, there, that I hadn't treated the subject of women's sexuality in a sustained way in any one section of the book. It was kind of, it was found in bits and pieces throughout the book. So I thought, given that I was gonna give the Burke lecture, I thought this would be a, a good opportunity to kind of look at what um, it would be like to portray as the text, as the ancient texts do, the life of a woman, and for that matter, the life of a man, from the time of conception until the time of death, and to see what the progress of a sexual life would be, uh, to get an idea not only of what the life of ancient Indian people were, since that's what the subjects of these texts were, but, uh, but also what it means to be a man and a woman in, these, in, uh, in this tradition, in the, in the ancient Buddhist tradition. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus on the life of a woman. Um, and I'm going to take you, as I say, on a kind of sexual life's journey, uh, beginning with her sexual embodiment, meaning how a woman comes to attain the body of a woman, um, her biological sex, um, what the texts have to say about how, gender roles, how fixed they are and how they're obtained, how gendered behavior happens. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about a woman's erotic life, what the texts say about women's desires and their fulfillment, what her romantic life is like, what her marriage might and might not be like, what motherhood meant, and what ideal old age was like. So I'm gonna take you in this kind of journey that you never find in any one text, but that it's possible to kind of gather all the pieces together to, to kind of give you this idea. So we, we begin with conception and birth. Both Indian and Tibetan texts believe that after a person dies, their Buddhists have a kind of allergy to talking about souls, but um, we, can, we can say something like a, a person's spirit um, continues into the next existence and is reincarnated depending upon that person's actions in the past life. If the actions are positive, they're reborn in a positive way, in a positive next life, they take a positive rebirth 
like a human rebirth. Human, be human rebirths are considered positive. If their actions are negative, they might be reborn in one of the negative states of existence. So let's assume that the woman whose journey that we're going to trace right now um, has accumulated a bunch of good karma and is about to be reborn as a woman. The tradition says that what impels that spirit, that, that is the spirit between lives, a person dies before they're reborn, it doesn't happen instantaneously, that person exists in this kind of ethereal form as a spirit, the actual term in Sanskrit is antarabhava, a person belongs to the intermediate state, the bardo in Tibetan. There's a new book out called Lincoln in the Bardo. Do people know, have you seen this? So the Bardo is that intermediate state, right? So this intermediate state being needs to be reborn into a human womb. And in order for that, what drives that is, first of all, that person's karma, according, according to these texts. Then something happens to actually make the spirit enter into the fertilized egg, and then gestation takes place, and then um, the fetus is born as a girl. Now, in Buddhism, the scenario that causes the spirit to be reborn, and to, be, to enter into the fertilized egg is, uh, is very interesting. It's been talked about often in, uh, in different sources, but it's a kind of Oedipus and Electra scenario, which means that uh, the spirit is somehow drawn to the place where the parents are having sex. And while the parents are having sex, the the spirit, the, the, wood, the future girl who's going to be born, um, because she's destined to be reborn as female, she develops desire for the copulating father. And at the same moment, she develops anger towards the, the, the wife, towards her future mother. These dual moments of desire for the father combined with anger towards the mother cause the mind of that spirit to enter into the fertilized egg. It propels the mind into the fertilized egg and conception takes place. This is the Buddhist account of how beings are conceived. Take it as you will. <laughs> this is what a fourth century figure, a fifth century figure whose name is Vasubandhu, one of the great philosophers of Buddhist India says. He says, the eyes of that spirit, of that intermediate state spirit, born from the power of its karma, um, behold, th those eyes behold its place of birth, even if it's far away. There it sees its father and its mother having sex. If it's destined to be reborn as a male, there arises a male's desire for the mother. And if a female, there arises desire for the father. Conversely, there arises hatred for the parent of the same sex. As a text called the Pragnapti states, either of two minds can manifest in the intermediate spirit, in, in, the, in, the, in the spirit that's about to reincarnate at that time. It may possess an attached mind or a mind filled with hatred. In fact, Vasubandhu says that both things are present. Confused by these two thoughts, but with a desire for sexual pleasure, it clings to the site where its parents' two organs are joined and thinks to experience sexual pleasure there. When it reaches the site of the mother's womb, it experiences sexual pleasure and remains there. Then its aggregates solidify. Its existence, its intermediate existence comes to an end and it's conceived in the womb. So this is the Buddhist story of conception. This is how the conception of human beings, in fact, of any womb-born being, that means mammals as well, happens in this way. We find it depicted in a variety of Buddhist art. This is actually a Tibetan medical painting that is based on paintings done originally in the 17th century. At the very top, you see um, the, the couple that we saw before with the little being uh, coming down the rainbow, uh, uh, right? That was about to enter into its mother. And then you see 
a bunch of egg-like things. The first four rows depict problems that either have to do with, with the egg or sperm that thwart conception. Then beginning with line five, you see a bunch of different eggs, and then you see the, the fetus slowly taking shape inside the, the womb. Um, you also see some animals, like a couple of fish, a turtle, a pig. This is because th the text also used these as analogies to say, at this point, the fetus is like this. It looks like this. At this point, it kind of looks like a turtle, and so forth. So there's a very developed embryology. In, and this comes from ancient Buddhist texts, but it was taken up by the Tibetan tradition. Until finally, at the very bottom, you see the mother who is carrying the womb. Now, you, in this, you, you can't see this in great detail, but, but you see here how the fetus is supposed to look at different stages. And then you see in the final row at the bottom, you see these four figures, with, which is the mother. And in one case, the mother is having a child on the right, another case on the left, one in the middle. And then the last one on the right, you see twins. The mother has, is carrying twins, right? You see two uh, children in her stomach. When the child is carried on the right side, it's said that, uh, that its sex will be male. When it's carried on the left side, the mother's left, it will be a female. Now, this isn't kind of value neutral. The right in, in Buddhist Asia, as in um, the West, is the preferred side, right? I think the Latin word for left is, someone know? Sinestra, right? So it, it, it's not a accident that this is related to the word sinister, right? Sinister, sinestra, left is considered worse, right is considered better. So male children get put on the right, which is simply to say that Buddhist tradition, like many other religious traditions, is and androcentric. It favors the male, right? So it was considered more auspicious for a, a, a male child, and that's why the male child is situated on the right, and the female child on the left. So our girl, who has been born and has gestated in her mother's womb, is located on the left side of her mother. But you notice that there's a child that's located in the middle. So what is this child? There's only two sexes, right, male and female. So what is the child that's located in the middle? Well, it turns out that the Buddhist picture of what constitutes biological sex is actually more complicated than just male or female. In fact, there are four biological sexes. There are biological males, biological females. These two sexes are called single-sexed single beings. They're considered normal or normative. And then the Buddhist tradition speaks of both beings who are both male and female. These are hermaphrodites. And beings who are neither male nor female, these are called asexuals. These last two sexes are called abnormal or queer, which is my translation of a very difficult Sanskrit term to translate, it's pandaka. I think queer comes pretty close. And these last two sexes are considered, therefore, abnormal, right? So if you look at, again at some depictions found in the Tibetan medical tradition, you find that the male is depicted here uh, very proudly with an erect phallus and a hairy chest, right? Um, the female is depicted, um, um, and the, the letters beneath simply say, male and female, po in the, in the case of the male, mo in the case of the female. Um, as emitting a discharge, that turns, to be, turns out to be menstrual fluid, so she is menstruating, and that is also important to the identity, to the biological identity of a woman, 
according to these texts, that she have a normal menstrual cycle. So male, female, the hermaphrodite is hard because this isn't extremely clear, but um, if you look closely, you would see that it has both sets of genitals, both a penis and a vagina. And then you have this being that in the text is called an asexual, which is supposed to be neither male nor female. And in, this, in these paintings, it is shown as simply having a small hole. Um, and the, the tradition is kind of simply assumed that everyone will know what it means by an asexual, but um, it, it really means someone with no genitals at all, but simply with, a, with an opening that is a urethra. Whether this is actually found in the real world or not, I'm not sure since I'm not a doctor, but um, anyway, this is what the texts say. The four possibilities that, that it is found here are actually philosophical possibilities. I mean, this is anyone who is familiar with Tibetan logic knows that this is a structure that's known as the, the Chetushkoti or the, the four possibilities, sometimes it's called the tetralemma in, uh, to, when the, if a Greek term is used. So it's X, Y, both X and Y, and neither X nor Y, right? So male, female, both male and female, neither male nor female. Okay, so these are the four biological sexes. And, but in the, in the text, the last two, that is the both and the neither option, the hermaphrodite and the asexual, are oftentimes combined into the single category called queer. So we can say sim more simply that biological sex is of three types, male, female, and queer. Now, um, why, why do, what causes a being to be male, female, or in this case, neuter or queer? The answer to this is, for the most part, the Buddhist answer to this is karma. Karma is the answer to everything. It's the reason why a person is born male, female, why a person is born rich as opposed to poor, uh, why a, a person is born in the United States as opposed to being born in India. The answer to all this is karma. But there were some Buddhist philosophers that wanted a, a kind of richer answer to this. And so what, what they did was they came up with this theory, what, I, what, what, what we can consider a kind of more proximate causal theory of sex in the form of what they called the sex determining factors. They said that um, males have the sex deter determining factor that's different from females. The sex determining factor are particles that are not visible to the naked eye. They are dispersed throughout the body. If you're female, you have a body that's filled with tiny little particles that are shaped like hollow drums. And if you're male, you have a body that's filled with tiny little particles that are shaped like thumbs. It's, again, probably no accident that there's some resemblance between the particle shapes and the organs, the, the, the genitals of the, the two of males and females, of men and women. These particles are responsible for everything sexual and gendered about uh, human beings. They're responsible for biological differentiation, for the fact that in the womb, boys are, are um, be become differentiated from girls. That the, once the child is born, they're responsible for the gendered identities and behavior of children and eventually adults. They're responsible for the sexual attraction of men and women for one another. And they're even said to be responsible for the type of sexual pleasure or orgasm that people experience. So these, this material cause, these particles that inhere within the body of men and women, right, that are found throughout the bodies of men and women, these, we can call them sex-identifying particles or sex-determining factors, 
are responsible for everything that makes men and women what they are. For example, the fifth century scholar Buddha Gosa says that the female sex factor determines a woman's genitals, uh, the fact that she has small, smaller hands, feet, mouth, broader lower body, narrower upper body, breasts, a face without facial hair. But strangely, he also includes with, within this things like hairstyle and clothing, as if somehow these were determined by the little particles that are running through people's bodies. In addition to that, he says, women's deportment is determined by these particles. So the fact that women walk, stand, eat, sit in certain ways are all determined by this. The fact that, in his words, that women walk in shorter strides and, to quote him, less assertively than men is due to these particles. And also the fact that gendered behaviors, right, the fact that Girls play with dolls, baskets, and mortar and pestles are the examples that he used. Um, comes from the, this sex determining factor. Now, not, Vas not Buddha Gosa, but this other scholar, Vasubandhu, says in addition to that, the, the fact that women have sexual desire for men is also determined by this physical cause, by these particles, and so is the specific type of sexual pleasure that women experience. So, so much for male and female, for men and women, but what about um, the case of queer children, right? Um, a third, the, the giant tradition, which is another tradition, South Asian tradition that's contemporary to Buddhism, its founder Mahavira lived more or less around the same time as the Buddha, postulates the existence of a third sex factor um, that is different from male and female and that is unique to queer people. This is not so in Buddhism. In Buddhism, there's only sexual, there's only, there's only scriptural warrant for the existence of two types of sex particles, male particles or female particles. And so the Buddhist authors are kind of in a quandary what, what to do, how to explain then queerness if it isn't caused by a specific third factor. And what they do is they say, well, queerness is due to the fact that the, either the male factor or the male factor is either absent, somehow goes missing, or becomes impaired in utero. And the the, the texts specifically say that this takes place, that, that when initially conceived, the child is, has the, or, the, either the male or the female sex factor, but that somehow something happens in the process of gestation that causes the child to be, um, that causes the sex factor to, to be impaired, which causes the child to be born queer. So basically what we have here is a kind of genetic theory of queerness. And then there's you know, typology of different types of queer people, which in the medical literature um, is found among um, different types of other illnesses and abnormalities. So we do have here a kind of medicalization of, uh, of queerness. Um, and specifically, they're found in this portion, uh, where, where you see different types of um, of queer people being depicted. Some male, some female. Um, the first one is, uh, is, is uh, teme, which means uh, having uh, no organs whatsoever. The next two represent a type of queer person that changes sex every 15 days according to the cycle of the moon. So this. Th just this is enough to tell you that this is a very different theory than anything like we're used to in Western medical tradition, right? This is not a theory of homosexuality. This is not even a theory of queerness by Western standards. So this is quite unique to the Indian tradition. The important thing for our purposes is that there's a strong causal link between sexual biology, right, 
the genitals, the secondary sexual characteristics, between, between that, which is determined by those particles, between gender, male or female identity and behaviors, sexual desire and sexual pleasure are all linked because they are determined by a physical cause, namely the sex determining particles. So this in Western tradition is, in feminist studies for example, is called determinism, this link, linking together of biology, gender, and sexual desire is called determinism. Okay, now we come back to our woman. So the little girl comes down on the rainbow, enters into her mother's womb in a moment of anger towards her mother and desire for her father, gestates, and, um, and is born. Um, at birth, she has the primary sex characteristics of a, of a little girl. Why? Because she has the hollow drum particles throughout her body. As she matures, the secondary sexual characteristics, breasts and so forth, begin to manifest, as do traditional gendered, I mean, female gendered identity and stereotypical female behaviors and sexual desire for men. And when she actually begins to have sex, she will, she will experience a unique form of pleasure uh, that is unique to her, um, to her anatomy. Now, when the Buddhist texts talk about women's erotic desires and their, their pleasures, um, this is, they're less than unanimous on this topic, but I'll give you the, the synopsis. Women, and in fact all human beings, are, are said to be polysexual. That means that they are equally attracted, not in, perhaps not equally, but they are at, attracted to men, women, and third gendered people. The norm, however, is heterosexuality. So um, even though both women and men are attracted to all three, gender, all three genders, the norm is for women to be principally attracted to men. Quantitatively, how much desire, how much pleasure does a woman have? Um, some texts say less than a man. Some texts say that she has about the same as a man. And some texts say that she has much more than a man. Let me read you just one quick, quick passage. This is, in fact, not from a Buddhist text, but from a, an, an, another Indian text. So this is from the Kama Sutra. Women want a climax that takes a long time to produce because their, de their desire is eight times that of a man. These eight times that of a man. Given these conditions, it's perfectly right to say that a fair-eyed woman cannot be sated by men. But this is true because men's desire is just one-eighth of a woman's, not because women do not experience the sexual pleasure not because women do not experience sexual pleasure. So there's a debate in this text about do women really have sexual pleasure at all? And Vatsyayana, who's the author of the Kama Sutra, says they certainly do have sexual pleasure, and in fact, they experience sexual pleasure eight times what men do. Um, so, but there are other texts that say that women have experienced much less desire than men and others that say that women have about the same amount of desire and pleasure as men. Qualitatively, there are kind of two broad theories. There's one theory that I call the endogenous theory, um, which means that women do experience um, a unique form of pleasure or desire unto themselves. And then there's an exogenous theory which says that they don't experience desire and pleasure, but that they only experience it vicariously through their partner. Um, this is, I think, interesting enough that it's probably worth uh, reading. Okay, so this is a commentator on the Kama Sutra. He says, one of the authorities cited in the Kama Sutra uh, likens the woman's desire to an itch, which a man scratches during intercourse, 
bringing her pleasure. But this is only one aspect of a woman's sexual desire and pleasure. We might call it the physiological part. When it is combined with emotional erotic pleasure, um, an arousal born from kissing, etc., she comes to experience a different psychological emotion. And it is this emotion that the texts say that is her true pleasure, that is not the physical aspect, but a, uh, a form of pleasure that is born both from uh, a physical part, such as kissing, and, um, and also from, um, from um, an emotion. The exogenous desire is found in this passage. In this passage, a woman is being compared to uh, a eunuch. So it's saying that, uh, so let me just read it. It says, even though a, uni a eunuch, uh, the, the word here is actually, it's a Tibetan word, zama, and it's trying to explain what this word zama means. So normally the word zama means eunuch, but the author of this passage is about to say that women are like eunuchs for a specific reason. So this is the context of this. So it says, even though a zama is, for example, someone whose testicles have been amputated or whose desire has degenerated, in the present context, it is another name for a woman. Someone who, during the sexual act, experiences the taste of desire through the other. That is, she has no endogenous internal desire herself. She experiences desire through the desire of her partner. Lacking the ability to herself act on the other through the erection of an organ of desire. So um, what this text is saying is that neither women nor eunuchs have innate endogenous sexual desire, a desire for sexual pleasure that resides within themselves. What desire they have is mimetic, the re reflection of their male desires, uh, male partner's desires. A woman is, according to this theory, unable to truly experience her own desire because, we are told, she lacks the ability to be active. So the logic goes something like this. No penis implies no erection. No erection implies no penetration, and no penetration implies no endogenous pleasure. But even this, the writer of this text had to concede that women appear to experience pleasure during sex, and so he comes up with an, indigenous, an, an ingenious solution. A woman experiences pleasure vicariously by associating it, by, by feeling the pleasure that her partner is feeling. Okay, uh, that's a quick note on women's desires. In her youth, the woman who is so born will, um, um, her desires, sexual desires are acknowledged. It, 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 she will be acknowledged to be a kind of sexual agent. She will be destined to a life of confinement, uh, protected from men in order to make sure that her virginity is, is preserved. And this is extremely important to uh, the, the family and to the girl both. Um, if the girl loses her virginity, then she becomes unmarriageable. And this is both a dishonor to the family, but it also means uh, it's, it's a tragedy for the young girl because it dooms her to either um, a life of, of uh, being single, or uh, perhaps uh, a life of uh, prostitution. It was not unknown in ancient India for girls who had, been, uh, who had lost their virginity to be sold uh, to brothels, for example. Once, once married, um, a, a girl might be betrothed from a very young age, but she will normally not be actually given to her husband until the time of puberty and then she is given or sold to the husband. Marriage in this tradition is not about love. These are arranged marriages. They're really about creating bonds between families. Men oftentimes had more than one wife um, if they had the means to support them. So 
when a girl entered into a marriage, she was oftentimes entering into a marriage in, in which there was already one wife, perhaps more than one wife. Wives are presumed to be faithful to their husbands. The Buddhist texts go on ad nauseum about what men can and cannot do uh, sexually, that is, in terms of, uh, they have a very elaborate theory of sexual ethics for men, but they don't really have practically, they hardly have anything to say about what women should and should not do. And the, re the reason for this, I think, is quite simple, because women are not allowed to do anything um, except to be accessible to their husbands. So there really is no need for a separate sexual ethics in the case of women. Their sexual ethics is uh, faithfulness to the husband. It's also presumed that a husband will have sexual access to his wife at all times, um, with some exceptions. So that means that marital rape is unknown in this tradition, right? It is essentially the husband's prerogative to have sex with his wife whenever he wants to. The times when it is not allowed, according to some texts, is um, when this might threaten the wife, the fetus, if the wife is pregnant, um, or if the wife has taken a temporary vow of sexual abstinence, which Buddhist women sometimes do for a period of 24 hours. So these are the exceptions. Otherwise, a husband is presumed to have sexual access. There are many different types of marriages. I've given you the most common one, which is that parents will sell off their girl child to a husband. Um, but there are really other types of marriages as well. Some of them involve no agency or choice. So for example, the one where the girl is sold, she has no choice in the matter. Also slaves, um, slavery was not uncommon in ancient India. Um, and a, a slave in a master's house, a female slave in a master's household, um, basically had to give her owner uh, sexual access. So this was presumed. But on occasion, her owner could decide to actually elevate the status of a slave and make her an official wife. And if so, then the, the, the slave, not that she would want to, but the slave also would be in no position to refuse. Prisoners and raids also had no, uh, who were taken in raid, women prisoners who were taken in raids had, were in no position to refuse. On the other hand, the texts do talk about women who um, choose, them, who themselves choose whether or not to stay with a man uh, uh, either out of love or out of lust for uh, her partner. There are also the stories of women who kind of enter into contracts with men and say, you provide for me materially, you give me clothes, food, etc., and I'll be your wife. So it, it wasn't as though it, um, Buddhist marriages were arranged marriages 100% of the time. Some of these marriages were happy. They involved love. The, the couple, even though they didn't know each other at the time that they got married, love would develop between them. The couple would have a, a, a good sex life. Um, they would have children. The husband would be caring. And caring in this context m means that he would treat, if he had more than one wife, he would treat his wives equally. He would be financially responsible, and he would have a restrained extramarital life. Buddhist husbands were, for the most part, were for the most part um, presumed to have a, an extramarital life. This was not considered a moral evil, um, either by the society or by the religious traditions of ancient India. Happy marriages also means having good in-laws, and it means freedom. If, if the wife is a Buddhist, freedom to support Buddhism. There are some stories that we find in the ancient text about a woman who is about to get married to a, uh, a husband that belongs to a non-Buddhist family. And beforehand, the parents reach an, an agreement where the woman doesn't have to, in a sense, convert, but can keep her religious tradition and continue to practice Buddhism. So this is the kind of Buddhist depiction of a happy marriage, what a good marriage is like. An unhappy marriage could be catastrophic, and there are depictions of this as well in Buddhist literature. There are loveless marriages. The couple never, go, never falls in love with, with one another. 
the husband is uncaring, he might favor one wife or more than one wife over others, creating factionalism within the harem. He might pay, patronize prostitutes, sometimes to the point of basically living in a brothel, and as a result is financially ir irresponsible because, of course, prostitution, prostitutes charged, and oftentimes there are stories of men losing their entire fortune, their life's fortune to, um, to their addiction to uh, brothels. Unhappy marriages might also be because in-laws might be abusive or violent, there might be jealous co-wives, and the wife, if she didn't bear children, this, might, this could be cause for the, the woman to be abandoned. Uh, but even if she bore children, it was often the case that women were only valued because of the children that she bore, in which case, in such an unhappy marriage, a woman is essentially little more than a baby factory, right? The producer of children. Not all women had the choice of being, marriage, of being married. Uh, prostitutes were oftentimes born into the profession. Prostitution was not a crime, nor was it a moral failing, as, 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 I, as I've mentioned. There are two types of female sex workers. Also, male sex workers are also mentioned, but we know next to nothing about them. But of the two types of female sex workers, one was called Vaishya, these were low-class prostitutes that basically provided just sexual services. High-class ganikas, on the other hand, were extremely cultured women who were highly educated, trained in the arts, uh, knew how to play musical instruments, could sing, could dance, could recite poetry, and were as much intellectual companions to men as they were sexual companions. Some of these women were extremely wealthy, and in fact, there are stories that the amount of tax that they paid were important sources of revenue for the coffers of a state that tells you the amount of, of money that they must have charged, especially ganikas. And it's important to note that they were, that they're always depicted as the object of men's desires. And this is often in contradistinction to wives. If we look at the text, and this I've culled this table from a variety of different sources, prostitutes are always portrayed in positive ways as opposed to wives. This is all from a, a text by an Indian, medieval Indian scholar whose name is Ishwaradatta. Prostitutes are happy, body positive, they enjoy sex, they learn it in the arts, learn it in the arts of love. Um, they have to be solicited, which makes which make men jealous, which means that there's an aspect of the hunt that's involved that makes it uh, enjoyable, pleasurable. This is what Ishwara Datta says. By contrast, he says, wives are depressed, they're ashamed of their genitals, they don't like to have sex. If they do, they have it as if through clenched teeth. Uh, they're uneducated, unskilled in love making, and of course, they're available at all times, so there's no element of the hunt involved. So this is maybe a unique feature, if, if not unique, it's certainly an important feature of Indian society that the true object of men's affections were not their wives, but were mistresses or prostitutes, which you see depicted here in uh, a very early, probably se second, first century BCE painting found in the Buddhist caves at Ajanta. We don't have the laments of unhappy wives in their own words, but here's a couple of poems that were written by men in the voice of the woman. The first one is a woman addressing uh, her friend. She says, the bond of his affection, meaning her husband's affection, broken, my value in his heart erased. This man now sees me as he does any other, his love for me now dead. I pass my days obsessing about these things. Friend, why does my heart break into a hundred pieces. And the second one is a woman addressing her husband. She says, your mistress lives in your heart, in your eyes, and in your dreams. Where then, Mr. Handsome, is there any room for me? These are not poems written by women. They were written by male poets, as if they were written by women. But nonetheless, they probably convey some of the sense of heartbreak that women in these unhappy relationships probably had to withstand. 
So what do women do in the face of this? The poets would have us believe that they accept their fate, that they sit at home lamenting, writing poems like the one that I just read to you. But in fact, we know from other sources that women, that when their husbands were unfaithful, that women also strayed, that they have affairs with men and sometimes with other women. There's one story about a group of women, a group of wives uh, bathing in the local bathing ho hole and having, engaging in sexual play with each other while there, while they were there. So it's clear that women were be being satisfied in a variety of different ways, but sometimes it wasn't necessarily with other, with other, um, with women or with men, it was perhaps in religion. And there are many cases of women seeking solace in religion and specifically in Buddhism. And when none of this seemed to work, there are cases when Buddhist monks at, uh, give advice to women that they should really divorce. And in fact, this happens on a couple of occasions. Some women, of course, never choose this route to begin with. These are nuns. And one of the most famous of which is depicted here, it's the nun Utpalavarna, who actually began life as a prostitute. Several of the Buddha's disciples were former prostitutes who later on became nuns. The, the Buddha never looked down upon prostitutes, and in fact, uh, oftentimes, when he was invited to their house to, for meals, then he would go. So Utpalavarna is considered one of the most famous of the Buddha's nun uh, uh, disciples. And nuns, of course, didn't have to worry about any of these things because they took vows of celibacy, live in single-sex communities, and their life was in many ways more fulfilling than the life of women, which could be very uncertain depending upon what her husband and in-laws were like. And in old age, um, we have, of course, different models, um, but for the most part, when the texts talk about old age, they talk about matrons, old matrons surrounded by generations of her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so forth. But there's also, there's also a story of an elderly couple that are close to death that have obviously had a very good life together. And they approach the Buddha, and they ask the Buddha, uh, they say, we have been with each other our whole lives. We love each other. We want to find each other in the next life. What, what do we have to do to do that? And the Buddha responds, if both husband and wife want to see each other, not only in the present life, but also in the life to come, they should have the same faith, the same ethic, the same level of generosity, and the same level of wisdom. This is how they see each other, not only in the present life, but also in the life to come. So what the Buddha is saying is basically, um, live a good religious life together and you will be reborn together. So there are stories like this as well, of couples who have led good married lives and are looking for uh, to be reborn, to meet each other again in the next life. What I haven't mentioned at all is that most of the examples that I've been giving to you really involve high-class individuals. That is, as you see depicted here, a high, in this case, a king um, with his queen and living with servants, with ministers, with even with specific types of elements. This is kind of the ideal uh, Buddhist family, if we want to call it that. But it's a high-class family. It's a person with means. Not every woman, not every man was like this, right? Obviously, the majority of society was not like this. So what was the fate? What, what, was, what was the sexual life of lower class women like? For example, people who were poor, women who were poor, or prostitutes, or paid workers, or prisoners. What, what was their life like? In some cases, their life was better than that of high class women because they were freer than high class women. For example, prostitutes had the right to uh, refuse clients. So they had the right to decide who they would sleep with and who they wouldn't. Um, and prisoners were protected from unwanted sexual advances of guards by law. 
If a guard was found making sexual advances on a woman prisoner, he was punished. So there were protections um, for many of these people. But the point is that we shouldn't, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't take everything that I've mentioned in the first three quarters of the talk as being paradigmatic of all of Indian society, because it wasn't. The same holds for men, right? So there are high class men. That's basically what I've been talking about. These men have great sexual freedom, right? They can have very rich extramarital sex lives. Uh, but this comes at a price being a high class man that means he has to provide for multiple wives and children he's responsible for protecting his women meaning he has to make sure that his that both his wives and his uh, female children are not violated by other men uh, and he has to safeguard the family wealth from his sons because if he has sons then his sons will, as he himself did, will spend a lot of their time in brothels when they're growing up as young men. And so he has to make sure that the family fortune isn't squandered away by his sons. The point is, the life of high class men was not always easy. Low class men, um, like low class women, sometimes um, actually had it easier. They either couldn't afford to get married at all because no woman would marry them because they were poor, or else they would have only a single wife. This obviously made it easier both for the husband and for the wife if there's only one of each to, that they had to worry about, right? Because he was poor, he had no access to prostitutes. So by default, he had no extramarital sex lives. And this doesn't mean, I mean, at, at times, low-class people experience a great deal of pain. Um, in very worst situations, we are told that men, women, and sometimes married couples both sold themselves into slavery. That's essentially gave up their freedom in order to be, to enter into the household of a richer person as a slave, simply to be taken care of because they were afraid of starving to death. The last type of uh, man is the monk, and like the Buddhist nun, monks have it relatively easy, at least as they're portrayed in the Buddhist sources, because they don't have to worry about any of this, right? They leave simple lives of, um, of celibacy in community, and therefore don't have to worry about the things that um, traditional uh, married couples had to worry about. And finally, about queer people, what their lives were like, we really don't know much about them. Um, some texts tell us that queer men were sometimes cross-dressers, that they wore their hair long, that they were dancers, which implies that uh, perhaps they were trans women. Um, some queer men were prostitutes. We have references to that in the text. But many queer people, both men and women, that is, people who had same-sex sexual desires, probably end, ended up entering monasteries. And this is because they didn't want to get married. And becoming a monk or a nun was really one of the few acceptable reasons for not getting married. So both in India and in Tibet, it was probably the case that a lot of queer people ended up in monasteries, even though um, there are regulations that require candidates, postulants for the, the monasteries, for the monastic life to be examined before they are admitted into the Buddhist order. But this didn't stop people then, and it probably doesn't stop people now, uh, queer people from entering Buddhist monastic order. OK, I'm at the end of my talk. Some aspects of what I've talked about will probably seem familiar even now. Other aspects, like people changing sex every two weeks according to the cycle of the moon, are going to seem very foreign. If nothing else, this tells us that the sexual and gendered lives of people were constructed culturally, that they differed in different periods of time and in different parts of the world. Does this have any contemporary relevance to today? I think it does. There, in many Asian countries, these ideas still are 
the foundational ideas for both religion and for ethical teachings. And they're, contempt they're relevant to contemporary Western convert, Buddhist convert communities because these are the very doctrines that these communities have to deal with as they try to fashion and construct their own sexual ethic in the modern world. On this note, I will stop and I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much. A magnificent lecture, thank you very much. What I found confusing, uh, though, is the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism. And I thought that they were very different in their approaches to sexuality. Could you be so very kind to elaborate more on the differences? Because a lot of the, on the slides of the sculptures or Kama Sutra itself, I thought were actually Hinduism that, texts. A, yeah, Could that, you kindly outline the differences between those two Hinduism and Buddhism approaches? Yeah, that's a very good question. Most of the statues uh, and the art that I've shown you, maybe, I think maybe all of it, or almost all of it, is Buddhist art. But it's true that I've, I quoted from some, some texts like the Kama Sutra, which is normally considered to be a Hindu scripture. And it's true that, that a text like the Kama Sutra is really, um, it begins with homage to, um, to Hindu deities and so forth. But the truth is that many of these texts that, are, that we sometimes consider Hindu were really common texts that, that were important to the lives of both Hindus and Buddhists. So there's nothing really all that Buddhist um, and all that Hindu about the Kama Sutra is really more about the lives of the sexual lives of people. And it's something that applied both to men and to women. The same is true, for example, of the legal and medical literature in India. There's, there's not anything that's really specifically Hindu about it. Sometimes there are, and sometimes these things tend to be important. Oftentimes, they tend to be minor. But a lot of what the legal texts, the, the, um, the medical texts, the erotic texts have to say probably applied as much to Buddhists as to non-Buddhists. So I take a lot of these works to be part of the pan-Indian cultural tradition and not specifically Buddhist. Now, there are cases that where there are clear differences between Buddhism and Hinduism. So for example, Buddhism sees monasticism as you know, the kind of highest lifestyle that people can undertake. Um, and they believe that this should be done as early in life as possible. So that, you know, young men entering the Buddhist monastic order, young women entering the nuns order. Whereas in the Hindu tradition, you have this idea that monasticism is also a good thing, but that really people should have lived a full life before they renounce in the last stage of life, which is called sannyasi. So there's, a person should first go through the period of training as a student, and then get married and have a family, and then retire to the forest, and then finally, only in the last stage of life, should they renounce the world. Whereas in Buddhism, that isn't the case. Anybody who's, who wants to renounce the world is, is welcomed into the monastic order from a very early age. There are differences. But a lot of the, you know, the designation of certain texts like Kama Sutra or the laws of Manu, so-called Dharma Shastra works, the legal works, these are really pan-Indian works. This is a follow-up, I think, to the question that was just asked, actually. Yeah, yeah. So um, the way that I read Wendy Doniger's translation of the Vatsayana Kama Sutra, right. Wendy, who was also a previous Burke lecturer, uh -huh. <laughs> um, is that uh, through this translation, it kind of, in some places, opens up or um, shows the ambiguity in some of the sexual and gender roles that were in the previous version even opening up to um, some examples of potentially third sex or women taking on roles, 
uh, through use of devices or other behaviors yeah. um, that may not have been there in the previous translation. And so I'm wondering if you could comment on that translation and its impact on our understanding of, of uh, women's gender and sexual roles in Buddhism. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's a wonderful translation. I use the translation in my book. I mean, I see no reason to retranslate passages that have already been well translated by, by Wendy. Um, I think, th and Wendy not only translates the root text, but in fact she makes reference to some of the important commentaries. Um, I think that commentary literature on the, on the Kama Sutra is also very, very important and very interesting. Um, it's true that, I mean, in part because Wendy Doniger's translations are frank, she doesn't hold back, right? So um, if there's something dirty in the text, she'll translate it the way it should be, you know, the way it was meant to be translated. I mean, dirty, I'm talking about in quotation marks. Um, so, um, for example, she talks about how prostitutes, um, what prostitutes think about different types of clients. And she says that, um, that the, I don't know if this is the favorite, but one of the favorite clients of prostitutes are gay men who want to dissimulate, want to pretend that they are doing the same thing as their other friends are doing by going to prostitutes, but in fact don't have sex with a woman and end up just sitting there talking to them. But have to go through the motions of hiring the prostitute in order to look virile in the eyes of their, um, of their friends. So it's details like this that give us clues into ancient Indian sexual life that we really don't have if we just look at the religious texts. Right? The religious texts are very good at proscribing things, telling people what they can't do, but they don't really tell us what people were doing. And this is an area where the Kama Sutra really kind of opens the world of ancient sexual life in India up to us. Hi, I'm not very familiar with Buddhism and you did a lovely job of giving us the ancient texts and the way life was when it got its start. But I, you've mentioned briefly commentaries and I was just wondering if this religion has a system of evolution and where beliefs change with you know commentary or consensus and adaptions to, you know, current ways that people look at the different genders and lifestyles. And so is there any way for evolution or is it strictly attached to the original texts? Uh, Buddhism, you know, it depends on what, who you ask because there are many different types of Buddhists. So if you ask contemporary Western Buddhists, they will say, well, these ancient texts are not applicable t to me in this day and age. Why should I consider them at all? You know. They don't, I don't take any type of ethical or other form of guidance. I'm not saying that all Western Buddhist converts will say this, some will say this. Um, so whether you want to call this evolution or not, I mean, you have the whole spectrum. You have some people that don't consider doctrinal texts, you know, the, either the words of the Buddhas or the commentaries of scholars over the centuries to be at all applicable. And you have people that we might call fundamentalists, on the other hand, where they believe in the verbatim truth of these texts. And you have that whole spectrum, just like you do in any, in practically all textual traditions, right? So I think one of the uh, challenges in, for contemporary Buddhists is to try and figure out where they stand in this um, range of views about the authority. Essentially what we're talking about is the authority of scripture, right? And is it possible for these ancient texts to be interpreted in a way that uh, make them relevant to the modern age? Or, or really was the truth 
expressed once and for all, and there's no need other than simply to understand what, what the words were, and the commentators have done a good job of that. There are people who believe that too, that, that there's no need to, really to go messing with the text. But we find this in every tradition. Right? We find this in Christianity, we find this in Judaism, we find this in Islam even. Um, and we find it in Buddhism too. So is there, I mean, there are people who grapple with this material and try to figure it out and try to figure out what's relevant and what's not in the modern age. And there are other people who say, no need to do that. This is, the Buddha spoke, there's no need to think about it anymore. And there are other people still who, who think, this is irrelevant to me. My form of Buddhism is very different from the, is very different. I practice mindfulness meditation. I don't read scriptures. We're almost out of time. Maybe I'll ask the last question. I was wondering if, if um, there are differences in both different branches of Buddhism in different areas about how you, you know, flexibly, they will, they will uh, uh, interpret these, these various texts in relation to the modern world. So for example, I know, I know Mahayana Buddhism best, and, and in Taiwan, for example, uh, the leading uh, masters uh, basically advocate something like, you know, monogamous marriage as an ideal, but like the Master Xing Yun, for instance, uh, says that uh, basically gay marriage is fine, and Buddhist monk presided over the first, you know, gay marriage between two lesbians in, in Taiwan. Right. And the Taiwanese legislature is, has just uh, approved of gay marriage, although the Catholic Church lobbied very strongly against it. And there's a public opinion issue there. But so anyway, so there they've taken kind of a, a, a lead in sort of monogamous marriage, but gay, lesbian, whatever, is okay. Right as long as they love each other and have some mutuality. Right. So that seems to be quite an evolution. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a really good point. So I've been talking about what texts say, and um, oftentimes more important than what texts say is what one's teacher says. And there are Buddhist communities in which teachers have come out on one side or another of this issue, mostly in favor of liberal interpretations of the ancient sexual norms saying this really isn't applicable in this day and age and today if two people love each other they should you know be able to express that either in marriage or through uh, having sexual relationships and so forth so um, contemporary teachers often do that and their word oftentimes has more weight than scriptures do within living buddhist communities so that's true. It's true in the Tibetan tradition as well. I think it's true in Asian Buddhism in general. Can I ask one more question? One kind of related to yeah, this. And then, and she can ask. Um, so it's you know related to these uh, the the two um, questions we had so far, and I'm just my impression was like listening to your talk and these you know uh, scriptural references. I was wondering if uh, you just from all the, you know, all your own research and reading. Do you find these references to sexual norms to be more descriptive or prescriptive? It struck me that many of these references, this might be my misreading, you know, or misunderstanding, but they seem more descriptive. And perhaps if that's the case, there's maybe a little more latitude for, you know, how future generations or com commentators may, you know, kind of either adhere to these norms or deviate from them. Yeah, I think, I think or you're is right. There, or is there, you know, for some of the, or maybe it's uh, no way to, you know, you can't even separate the two things, that descriptive. No, you can separate the two things. Okay. Yeah, you can separate the two things, and you're right, that mostly what I've talked about today is descriptive. So what I've done is kind of given you a description of the sexual life of a man or a woman. I mean, most, mostly I've spoken about the, sex, the a sexual life of a woman. Um, and that has been mostly descriptive. And these, this is description based upon what is found in the text. What I haven't touched upon today is the sexual ethical doctrines of Buddhism. That is the last chapter of my book 
And I've given this as a talk in other contexts, so I didn't want to repeat it here today. There, what you have is prescriptive norms. So the idea, for example, that um, anything other than penal vaginal sex performed no more than culminating in no more than five orgasms in a night. <laughs> this is what the texts say. I'm not kidding. Um, and performed only at night in privacy, away from religious sites. This is the only sex that's permitted in the Indian and Tibetan texts. Basically, the first thousand, the first almost 1,500 years of Indian understandings of sexual ethics. It's actually more complex than this. Um, I found through my research that the sexual ethical norms begin very simple. It's basically uh, a prescription against, a prohibition against adultery, meaning taking a man taking the spouse of, a not per, of, a, of another man, for example or to take a girl who is still under the protection of her parents as a sexual partner. This is prohibited. This is the simplest idea of sexual evil, right? Of, of a, a, a ethical, sexual ethical wrongdoing in the Buddhist text. But over time, Buddhist monks begin to pile on more and more rules. So for example, and by the way, you can't have sex during the day. And by the way, you can't have anal sex or oral sex or masturbate or, and then more and more rules get piled on. And all of this begins in around the third century CE. Before that time, you have just the simple prohibition against adultery. So then the question becomes, why the third century? And this now comes back to the Kama Sutra because it's in the third century that texts like the Kama Sutra begin to become popular. And my, I believe that as a response to this, that Buddhist authors begin to worry that with the rise of this erotic literature, these er erotic manuals, that Buddhist, good, good Buddhist laymen are gonna get too many ideas. And so they begin to clamp down. And they say, this isn't allowed, that isn't allowed. If you're a Buddhist, OK, these people over there, maybe they're doing it, but you're not allowed to do this. So we come back to the original question about the Kama Sutra. But what's new? Say again. What's new? We know what you've explained to us has been very good. And it would be good for many, many people to study the first, second, and third century. But why haven't, haven't civilization or religions and Buddhists and everybody else know the basis of male and female, like you've been describing? And so that's why I will be interested in your next book about ethics. I will be. Because what today? I mean, they call them queer people. Why can't modern civilization accept them as people? I mean, we use the word queer because they're not the same. But why can't our modern civilization? I don't see why we haven't caught up from the third, fourth, fifth, 16th century, and we're still calling people odd, and it's a sin, and it's unethical. And you were just saying they add more to what's not right. And this is yeah, not so, you know, yeah. I, this is all education. You know, but where are we today? I, th I think, I mean, those are all good points. I think, Who was it, Toynbee, that said that unless we know the past, we're going to, we're destined to relive the, the mistakes all over again? I think for religious traditions to be able to um, go beyond misogyny, patriarchy, 
androcentrism, homophobia, that what they need to do is, under, first, they need to understand how these things manifest in their historical traditions, and then deal with them, right? It's kind of a therapeutic approach to dealing with injustice in religious traditions. You kind of have to f figure out where it's coming from in the past in order to be able to work through it and come to a, to a more just future. So I'm not sure that I'm ready to write the next book, which, is, which would be a more theological, a more ethical book. Um, I mean, dealing with ethics. But hopefully, the material that I've worked on, which is the historical material, the stuff from the you know, very origins of Buddhism, that form the foundation for all the problems that we have today, will provide the material that people can then look to and say, this is, this is wrong for this reason. And this is what we need to do to kind of work our way beyond this type of injustice to more just positions. OK, on that point, I will call it an end. Is that? Thank you. Very much. Thank you.